Always I have been a charlatan, a register of human emotions. It was the eyes. She was good-looking, not gorgeous, rounded but not voluptuous, distinctive but not striking. She burst on the scene in 1915, an overnight sensation in A Fool There Was, her first film. In the film, she is the nameless vampire, a thoroughly sexual woman who uses her erotic appeal as the Reaper uses his scythe to cut men down. It was her eyes, dark, limbed with powdered antimony sulfide called coal, a preparation used especially in the Middle East. Every dream, every goal, every conquest was won with those eyes. the entire library of the Fox Film Corporation burnt to the ground. Lost in the ashes were the original negatives of every Fox feature starring the first true siren of the silver screen, Theda Barrett. For four brief years, she was among the most famous women in the world, an icon of dangerous sexuality, the first star to have her biography tailor-made by the press. She was also the last star to embrace on screen the acting style of the 19th century stage. Hailed by critics as a consummate actress, her art was revealed through movement, and without her filmed legacy, the actress was lost. Dita Berra became a curio, her image forever frozen in movie stills, greeting cards, and stamps. Dita Berra is unique among film stars in that her image comes down to us almost entirely from still pictures. She made something like 40 films, and only a handful of them survive, but the images of Cleopatra and Salome with the skimpy costumes and the exotic poses are what people remember. They don't know the actress, they don't know her films, but they know the image that she projected on, on screen, or at least in the still pictures. It may be that in every woman there is Carmen and Cleopatra, Juliet and Salome. Through inherited instincts, a pretty woman soon discovers her good points. In this way, she begins a study of an exact science called sex appeal. To understand the fame of Theda Berra, we need to understand why so many people were willing to think of female sexuality as something intrinsically evil. Something I'm always talking about in film when people talk about women as objects of male desire, how they're not just objects, they're subjects too, by virtue of activity. They're not passive, and she certainly wasn't. I mean, if anything, she was the one who seduced men into passivity. There was something enveloping about this. She didn't keep to her space. Blame it on Charles Darwin. His ideas seized the imagination of the public as well as the scientific community. They applied his theories of evolution and natural selection to American society and called it social Darwinism. Social Darwinism became extremely popular in the early 20th century. Only those who were truly capable of um, fighting others were able to uh, stay up on top. And by staying up on top, they essentially uh, uh, led the whole race further up as well. Theda Berra was the natural enemy of our race. As Fritz Leiber Jr. would write, there are vampires and vampires, and the ones that suck blood aren't the worst. This was Theda. Her food was man's vital essence. 
The vital essence theory held that every person was sent into the world with uh, a finite amount of vital essence. And this vitality was stored in the male sexual organs. So a young man who was trying to become a, a captain of industry needed to uh, maintain as much of his vital essence as possible and translate that vital essence into brain power. By this theory, every time a man had sex, he spent his vitality and became just a little bit dumber. And Theta Bera, they said, was the woman no man could resist. All men fear the sexually rapacious or even sexually hungry woman both is something that they've dreamt all their lives for instead of these pallid women who have headaches all the time. At the same time, there's a terror. Can I satisfy her? A fool there was, and he made his prayer, even as you and I, to a rag and a bone and a hank of hair. We called her the woman who did not care. But the fool, he called her his lady fair, even as you and I. By 1915, Kipling's popular poem was part of the fabric of modern life. Everyone had read it. Schoolboys on the street could recite it. That year, Theda Bera would cause a sensation in a movie based on the poem. A series of events begun in England around 1897 would set the stage for Vera's entrance, and it all began with a romantic liaison between an actress and an artist. A Fool There Was started life as a painting by Philip Byrne Jones in 1897 of a woman, possibly Mrs. Patrick Campbell, the famous actress, leaning over her victim, smiling evilly at him with her hair spreading over him. The victim might have been a thin version of the artist himself, Philip Byrne Jones. As the story went, Philip had an affair with the actress. She dumped him for his more famous father. As revenge, Philip created a painting portraying her as a vital essence vampire, laughing over the husk of a used up man. Rudyard Kipling wrote a poem called A Fool There Was, supposedly based on the painting. The painting, entitled The Vampire, and the poem appeared together in a London exhibition in 1897 creating exactly the kind of sensation Philip wanted. But when the controversy boiled over, Byrne Jones denied even knowing the actress, whereupon Mrs. Pat cheerfully denied his denial. She happily capitalized on her vampire reputation and some years later appeared in a play called Belladonna. Mrs. Pat created the role of a vampire-like wife who travels to Egypt, finds a lover, and poisons her husband. The idea of the predatory female was something that was in the air at the time. It was a time when women were sort of spreading out into the real world, looking for the right to vote, looking to move into the workforce. Uh, and there were a number of people who felt threatened by this, men of course. Apparently this held true for Philip too. He failed to achieve the success of his celebrated father and eventually faded from the scene to a life of titled obscurity. What became of his painting is, to this day, a mystery. American playwright Porter Emerson Brown created a play based on the poem, which became a Broadway hit starring Robert Hilliard. Brown turned his play into a popular novel, which featured a reproduction of the painting on the cover. Without apology to Kipling, Tin Pan Alley produced a song. The popular dance team of Alice Ice and Bert French created something called the Vampire Dance, which is preserved in this film titled The Vampire, released by Calum in 1913. Women vampires had become an international phenomenon. This was not lost on an ambitious 35-year-old Brooklyn theater owner by the name of William Fox. William Fox was a son of a bitch. He was a tight-fisted, grasping, um, calculating individual. Some of that perhaps can't be helped. He was born in poverty and strove to get out of it, and he did. He tried vaudeville and failed. 
He went into the, uh, he claimed the pants pressing business, others called him a rag picker. Then he was hoodwinked into putting his savings into a failing theater. He bought the theater and uh, through his genius started expanding. Building his Nickelodeon theater business vertically, Fox expanded into distribution and eventually film production. Toward the end of 1914, Fox started to produce his own films. The first one was Life Shop Window, which was based in, uh, on a play from the 1890s. And many of the early Fox films were based on plays. It was a trend in the industry to produce feature films based on plays. And one of the plays he acquired was Porter Emerson Brown's 1906 play, A Fool There Was. Actor Robert Hilliard played John Schuyler in A Fool There Was, both on Broadway and on tour. His transformation from virile and upstanding husband to raving degenerate in three acts was considered a tour de force. The woman who seduced Schuyler had no name. She was called only the Vampire. William Fox purchased the film rights from Hilliard and his producers. In the role of the fool, he cast Edward Jose, who brought in an actor-director by the name of Frank Powell. Years later, Fox claimed that when he asked Hilliard about casting the woman, he was told it didn't matter. In my experience, I have had to change my leading lady six times. As soon as one scored a tremendous hit in the part, she would become unmanageable, and I had to let her go. My advice would be to put the girl you choose under contract, and the part will make her. Fox then asked director Frank Powell for suggestions. Frank Powell was a former stage actor who became a film director and had just been hired by Fox in 1914, just about the time he was making The Stain for another company. Now, Theta was an extra in The Stain. The big question is, was she an extra on The Stain and that's where Frank Powell found her, or did he put her as an extra in The Stain because he wanted to screen test her? No one really knows that and there are varying stories on both sides of the question. The woman who appeared before Fox was not named Theda Berra. She was introduced as Theodosia de Coppet. 29 years old, she had nine years' experience as a stage actress in minor roles. Other actresses like Virginia Pearson, with greater film experience, were suggested. But Fox wanted an unknown for his vampire. To launch her film career, he turned to his publicity team. Al Seelig and Johnny Goldfrapp were two writers for the New York World, and they were also freelance press blacks and PR men with great senses of humor, and uh, they were just very good at making up stories. They were perfect for the film industry at the time because William Fox knew that the best way to publicize this film was publicity. He needed stories and he needed wild stories to publicize this film. Seelig and Goldfrapp created the first manufactured star. Lots of actors changed their names, but this woman would be created from the ground up, and the ground would be Egypt. Born in the sands of the Sahara, her father, an Italian sculptor, lost in the desolate wastes. Saved by a beautiful French actress, they made love in their Bedouin tent, their child born in the shadow of the Sphinx. But what to do for a name? Keep it simple. Take the Arab, spell it backward. Shorten Theodosia to Theda. Theda Berra. Fox placed his creation under contract. Selig and Goldfrapp claimed it was later amended with eight famous clauses. You cannot marry within three years. You must be heavily veiled while in public. You cannot take public transportation. You cannot appear in the theater. You cannot attend Turkish baths. You cannot pose for snapshots. You cannot close the curtains on the windows of your limousine. And you can only go out at night. Selig and Goldfrapp weren't finished. After childhood in the desert, Theda Berra had achieved fame in Paris, the toast of the Theater Antoine and Grand Guignol. There, director Frank Powell discovered her and whisked her away to safety as German forces advanced through France. Though unconfirmed, legend has it that Fox first presented Theda Berra to the world at a press conference held in a darkened hotel room. The famous press conference in Chicago was a complete setup. Theta just sat there. She was not used to talking to the press yet, so she barely said a word. The studio people handed out handouts to the reporters about her romantic background, being born in the shadow of the Sphinx, and how she was a big star in Europe, and Theta just sat there and looked as romantic and as mysterious as she could. 
Now, supposedly, after the press conference ended, Luella Parsons wrote that Theta threw open the windows and said, give me air in a Midwestern voice. I don't think that ever happened. It was a great story. It gave Theta the publicity and it tipped people off from the very beginning that she was not what she was pretending to be. Well, the thing I find most remarkable about the Theta Barra legend was that from the very beginning, it was known to be a legend. And I think that's one of the things that is so appealing about the legend. Everybody knew from the beginning that it was a joke and they were all in on the joke. A Fool There Was opened in January 1915. It was Fox's fourth release and it made his company. Fox's publicity had created the setting for a jewel and that gem was Theta Barra. She really does somehow belong to the world of myth. I think what shocked and surprised me was really how completely monstrous she is. It's just kind of amazing that the end, I mean, she is such a complete predator. She is like the archetype of the bad woman. I mean, in the perennial division of women into virgins and whores, she is the ultimate whore, the ultimate seductress. Theta Bera is quite the most revolting but fascinating character that has appeared upon the screen for some time. Bold and relentless, it is filled with passion and tragedy, shot through by the lightning bolt of sex. The film remains true to its theme. Theta Bera is an instant triumph. There is no birth certificate for Theta Bera. She claims to have been born on the cusp between fire and water. Her birthday is July 29th, but the year became variable. However, information from the U.S. Census sets her birth in Ohio, 1885. What difference does it make where I was born? They say that I was born in Chicago, in New York, in Cairo, even in a cyclone cellar. To satisfy idle curiosity, I myself chose the African desert as my professional birthplace. Did she choose Egypt, where Mrs. Pat's Belladonna roamed the sand? Whatever her story, Fox Films' ultimate vamp was born Theodosia Goodman, the first child of a Polish father and a rather flamboyant French-Swiss mother. Theda was a nice Jewish girl from Cincinnati. I was born in the suburbs of a town in the Middle West. It was a comfortable home with porches, a garden with great trees in it, and a stable in which the ponies were kept, which my sister and I rode. She claimed 1890. She later claimed 1892. She never would admit her real age. She was of the school that believed that a woman who will tell her real age will give away everything. And that wasn't Theta Barra. Her father, Bernard Goodman, originally Guterman, was a naturalized citizen. He worked as a tailor, first an employee, later in his own shop. A protege recalled Bernard as a proud, principled man who stood up for his fellow employees. Pauline de Coppet Goodman, her mother, owned her own wig making business. Her client list included professional actresses. With the two-income household, the Goodmans were able to provide their three children with a middle-class upbringing. My mother was perhaps the most beautiful woman I have ever seen. She had waves of soft, rich Titian hair. Her skin was like rose satin. Her eyes were never sad like mine. Her marriage to my father was a true romance. Their first daughter was nicknamed Teddy by the family. Considering the fact that Theta was rather quiet as an adult, she was a surprisingly enterprising and mischievous child. She used to cut holes in the screen doors and run away from home wearing her mother's clothing. They actually built a cage for her in the backyard to keep her where they could find her. Theta's brother Mark was born in 1888. The little sister Lori followed in 1897. Bernard and Pauline brought their children up in the Jewish faith, and Theta's bat mitzvah was celebrated when she was 13. She had a very nice Midwestern Booth Tarkington childhood, uh, very normal, close family, about as normal a childhood as you can really find in any movie star I can think of. I always wanted to be the center of the stage, even when I was a baby. My favorite selection at the age of six was The Dirty Faced Brat. What a delight when I found that I could make people cry. The art of dramatic recitation was popular in 19th century America. Books, such as the Peerless Reciter, provided scripts and instruction in the art, including photographs of actors and illustrations of standardized Del Sartre poses, indicating a rainbow of emotions. Assume a bright expectant Extend attitude. the right arm, as in figure two. 
calling the listeners in the voice out your full, story. rich and free. Use the gesture and signaling of figure eight to beckon your audience. Theta loved it all. Theta learned by observation. Once, her mother fainted. Young Theodosia went to work. One part of me performed its restorative agency, aromatic spirits of ammonia, 20 drops, and a little water. The other part was mentally tabulating all the while the symptoms of her facial expression, labored breathing, and so on for future reproduction, all with the same idea. I may have a chance to use this in some part. Cincinnati, once gateway to the West, was visited by many touring thespians. During Theta's formative years, American actresses like Julia Marlowe and Maude Adams played the city. And while these were honored names, Theta was well aware that still greater acclaim belonged to the legendary names of Europe. Campbell from England, Duza from Italy, Bernhardt from France. Theodosia Goodman was completely theater mad. She dreamed of grease paint and lights and applause. But first, she had to finish high school. It was a college prep school. She was very, very active, both on the school newspaper and in the drama department. And she had a minor role in the senior play, Our American Cousin. And one of her classmates wrote in the yearbook that she had a fine dramatic appeal and that there was a genius. Despite her interest in acting, her parents were more appreciative of her talents as a musician. She prided herself on her ability to sing and stay in tune. She even managed to practice piano while reading a book at the same time. Till the book was finished, I faithfully practiced my scales. What did she wish for? Her Walnut Hills High School yearbook reveals her chosen motto. With heart and fancy all on fire to climb the hill of fame. Theodosia graduated high school in 1903 and she attended the University of Cincinnati for two years, which was not all that unusual for women at the turn of this last century. Being asked at the university to choose a special course, I shut my eyes and selected logic. I remember my mother tying a wet cloth round my head and giving me a black brew called coffee to keep me awake while I swallowed my logic. She was a very well-educated woman. She was very interested in literature from an early age. I think she was the only one of the early stars who did have any college education at all. Desire for the stage overcame her. She must move to New York to continue her music studies, she insisted. I ever had the same violent and burning desire to conquer something that eluded me. After much opposition, my father gave me my fare to New York. I arrived in New York alone. Theodosia had not come to New York for music. She was determined to become an actress. I had my experiences going around to dramatic agents looking for an engagement in a profession I knew nothing about. At last, I was engaged for a small part in a road company at a salary of $25 a week. The brief tour proved a miserable experience for Theda. She left mid-tour and returned to New York where she was joined by her mother and sister. Records for the next few years are spotty. We do know that in 1908 she was in Molnar's play The Devil, which was in New York. She appeared with Edward Stephen, not George Arliss as it's usually reported, and at that time there were two productions running concurrent. She also said that for that first performance she took the stage name of Theodosia de Capet. It's very frustrating for a biographer because Theda kept detailed scrapbooks of her career, but those from before 1914 were lost in an apartment fire. Later, she claimed to have been an actress in an English traveling roadshow doing Shakespeare. She claimed to have acted in Paris. She appeared in a national tour of The Quaker Girl, a popular operetta. Actress Hedda Hopper, later a famous gossip columnist, was also in the play. Many years later, she wrote, Theodosia was a believer in spiritualism and read about it constantly. The Theo spirits got to me to the point where I began hearing tapping on the wall behind my bed. 
Though they remained friends for life, Hopper didn't think much of Theda's acting in 1912. Theodosia played a Frenchwoman with an accent that wouldn't fool a five-year-old. Oh, brother. Despite her lack of success, Theodosia de Coppet Goodman was remembered by those she met, including theatrical producer, later film director, Cecil B. DeMille. I failed to take much notice of Theodosia Goodman, although she used to come to our office hopefully when she heard we might be casting. She had to change her name to Theta Berra before she had her chance to add a new symbol, the vamp, to American mythology. No less than Mrs. Patrick Campbell herself became a friend, subletting Theta's New York apartment in 1910. But the most fascinating story of Theta's theater years involves her purported trip to Europe. The story has doubters. Neither of her biographers found corroborating records, and most details of her travel to Europe are unknown. But the date of her return has recently been discovered in passenger manifest records kept at Ellis Island. Theodosia de Coppet returned to America on the Teutonic, docking in New York on October 20th, 1910. Her age at arrival was listed as 24. How long had she been abroad, and what did she do while away? We may never know for certain, but two very colorful characters have recorded portions of the story, and Theda herself hinted at the beginning of her odyssey. There followed a year or two of weird, incomprehensible experiences which are too intimate for the public eye. They flourished for a time in that beautiful twilight called love. They concerned the usual emotional surprises that are the mystery of youth. A Greek drama which was never produced led me to Europe. I found myself in England, a member of one of those traveling open-air companies that give very poor Shakespearean performances. The company was just as obscure as I was. She traveled to France. There, she met Isadora Duncan's family. Mary Desty, Isadora's friend and biographer, tells of a troubled romance between a future film vampire and an unnamed young artist. Isadora believed in this man's genius, but he was in a bad, nervous state owing to this girl's being a spiritualist and doing the queerest things. So one Sunday morning, she saw him off to Moscow. Being very tender-hearted, she did not tell the girl at once, but asked her to drive with us and go to lunch. Isadora finally broke the news that he had gone. The future cinema star arose and said, I curse you. The gods of my fathers curse you and your children forever. And at that very instant, we were on the spot where years afterward, the automobile with Isadora's children entered the Seine. Desti's son was 12 years old at the time. Not too many years later, he would change his name and become famous as film director and playwright Preston Sturges. In his autobiography, Sturges finishes the story. Mother had run into her at Isadora's, and discovering that the girl was temporarily hard up, Mother invited her over to our place. Her name was Theodosia de Capet. She was about 17, very dark and snaky, and just at the end of some kind of adventure with a member of the Duncan family. We used to talk practically all night. She explained to me that she was not like other women, but much more primeval. I can smell you from here, she breathed in the dark. I don't mean anything unpleasant, you understand. I mean as a tigress might smell her prey before leaping on him. I'm sorry to report that I was never leaped upon, and presently Theodosia's father came through with a check, and mother and I put her on the boat train. I returned to New York, a slender, pale, sad-eyed girl. Nearly nine years on the stage, and still no real success. But she is a determined person. She doesn't turn to something else and just says, the hell with it, I can't do that, I'll go do something else. I'll be a nurse or, or a teacher or a typist or a telephone operator. No, I want to be an actress. And by golly, she pursues it. One day I was going along the street and a man came up and spoke to me. He was very polite, very apologetic. He told me he was an agent for moving pictures. For her first starring role, Theda took the ferry across the Hudson River daily to film at the studio Fox had rented in Fort Lee, New Jersey. Additional location work was done in Florida. A Fool There Was costs nearly $17,000 to make $16,899, and it grossed worldwide about $137,000. So it was a tremendous hit in its time. Fox had struck a nerve with Fool. It turned Theda Berra into a star. And through her success, it made his company.
This is one of the interesting things about her all the way through. She, she uses up men. I mean, she exhausts them and depletes them. Apparently, the streets of New York are sort of littered with her ruined ex-lovers. That These sort of homeless men come up and sort of hold on to her, and she uh, sort of scorns them. And this one in particular follows her on the boat, and he has a gun, and he's going to kill her. And in this sort of magisterial way, she, just, she doesn't flinch. And she sort of puts her hand up and presses the gun down. This is the point where she says, kiss me, my fool. And this, this line is sort of reverberated through the decades. What the phrase, kiss me, my fool, really means is show me your manhood and by showing me your manhood you can show that even though you're a fool you're still a man he isn't able to do that and it uh, destroys him he has uh, been driven to a level so low that he is neither male nor female anymore The photoplay of Fool There Was follows the story of John Schuyler, newly appointed American ambassador to England. Schuyler is married with a loving wife and a young daughter. Schuyler is part of the Anglo-Dutch upper class of uh, Eastern uh, United States. He has never encountered uh, a sexual woman. His wife has been a perfect household nun from the very beginning. The child is, is called innocence. So we have, in a sense, in the movie, three stages of women. The innocent child woman, the household nun, and the sexual woman, the vampire. Enter the vampire. She spies the announcement of Skylar's appointment in a newspaper and sets out to snare him. She secures passage on the ship that is to take Skylar to England. And when he comes on board, she has this rose it's sort of a symbol of her decadence and, and voluptuousness and she drops it so that he'll have to pick it up which he does and when he leans down to pick it up suddenly he sees her ankle <laughs> you know and it's like a glimpse of stocking is something shocking we realize suddenly that we're in this era where to even see two inches of flesh beneath the skirt was titillating beyond all imagination it's, it's the story of the weak-willed man who can't defend himself against the predatory woman. And this is, this is like the struggle of civilization, the end of civilization, if she wins. Cut to Italy. Months later, Schuyler has abandoned both his family and his government position. He is lost in the pleasure of the senses until a letter comes from home. Remarkably, Schuyler's wife understands that her husband is innocent, unable to resist the vampire. After Schuyler and the vampire return to America, the faithful wife seeks out her weakened man to bring him home. Just when she appears to be successful, the vampire arrives. It's not for nothing that she's called the vampire, because the kiss that she plants, for example, on the uh, husband in the movie becomes uh, the vampire's kiss. It becomes the kiss whereby she essentially draws the vitality out of the husband and uh, it becomes the central image of the movie and it becomes the most shocking image of the movie simply because everyone who saw that realized that this was in a sense a form of taking the vitality taking the the man's uh, semen and uh, uh, drawing it into her herself skyler is finished a used up wreck well i love the scene where she's crawling down the stair like a snake. She turns men into sniveling, crawling insects. And this too is in accord with certain theories of the time about a woman taking away a man's vital essence, that sex itself was something that rotted the brain. The, 
Tentress is a threat to masculinity, to the male ego. You hardly ever see them brought quite that low, quite that permanently. And if so, there's usually some kind of retribution. There's no retribution here. You're left with this stark image of complete destruction. And it's kind of wild, you know? It's, just, it's kind of exciting just for that, when you see something that, that unexpected. To sum up 1915 in one sentence, uh, nobody becomes a somebody. The word vamp came into the language. You'll see it in a dictionary from that year. It meant a woman of the type that was portrayed by Theta Barra. Vamping became a verb and vamp an adjective. With the success of A Fool There Was, I renounced all former expectations of the art of acting. I cut my soul in two. One half I kept for myself, the other half I gave to the movies. My first picture was a success that surprised everyone. I myself was not quite convinced when it was over that I could ever do it again. Fox rolled cameras on a second film at the studio in Fort Lee. Theda took the Hudson River Ferry again to play a vampire, but this time only in a supporting role. The Kreutzer Sonata opened less than two months after A Fool There Was. The star was famous stage actress Nance O'Neill, but it was Theda Barra's name that theater owners placed at the top of the marquee. Filming continued without break, a new feature almost every five weeks. Fox's scandalous French Arab star skyrocketed to fame. The Devil's Daughter, Destruction, and Sin were potboilers that promised more of the vamp and delivered what they promised. Theda Barra had become Fox's most popular female star. Then a new man entered the scene. His name was Raoul Walsh. Theda's biggest production of the year was Carmen. Raoul Walsh was hired by William Fox to make a version of Carmen with uh, Theda Barra. The story of Carmen was public domain, and uh, Cecil B. DeMille was making a version with Geraldine Farrar, the opera star on the West Coast, at the same time Walsh was working with Theda Barra on the East Coast. In his autobiography, Walsh says he convinced Fox he could beat the DeMille production to release, using sets already constructed for a different story. But before Walsh could start, Fox required he get Barra's approval. I drove to 97th Street, where she was living with her mother and sister. I could hear DeMille's cameras clicking in my ears. All she had to do was say no, and Carmen would be grounded as far as Fox was concerned. After she had read the story, she gave me that siren smile which was making her famous, and nodded enthusiastically. I like it. When do we start? Two days later, we were at Fort Lee, making the first sequences. I found an old piece of rose velvet brocade, an old sleeveless muslin waist, and added some glass beads, a Spanish comb, and coarsened my features and makeup to give to the face that defiant challenge of Carmen, the factory girl. That was the kind of girl I had become inwardly, and I succeeded in looking like her outwardly. Walsh was a dashing young director. As an actor, he had just played John Wilkes Booth in Birth of a Nation, released earlier that same year. Before this, he played the young Pancho Villa in a film shot partially on location with Villa himself. He and Theta enjoyed each other's company, which made Walsh's fiancée, actress Miriam Cooper, jealous, as she revealed in her autobiography. She was coarse, overweight, and unattractive. I thought she was terrible. Theta went out of her way to uh, tweak her, making moo eyes at Raoul Walsh and things like that. Do I think anything went on sexually between them? Absolutely not. Theta did not have the time to do that. Hell, Fox was grinding films out at almost a film a month. Walsh, for his part, called Theta the most tolerant person he ever met in his directing career. When an onset accident dumped his star in a lake, Walsh pulled her out. Sopping wet with her makeup running down her face and her hair a sodden mess, I expected her to explode and walk off the set. Instead, she gave me a watery grin and said, These things happen. Both the DeMille and Walsh versions of Carmen were released with terrific publicity on the first day of November 1915. Critics praised both films. The dueling Carmens became a national event. Advertisements proclaimed the unique qualities of the Fox production in terms that would make P.T. Barnum proud. 
It was the movie event of 1915. Charlie Chaplin did a burlesque making fun of both movies and of the original opera. Birth of a Nation has more historical significance, but Carmen was the movie event of the year. Mark Sullivan, who did a monumental history of uh, America from 1900 to 1925, covers Carmen. He barely touches on Birth of a Nation. Despite its popularity, Theda's Carmen is at present, like most Fox Silence, a lost film. By the end of her first year in the movies, Theda Barra had starred in 10 Fox productions. In nine, she had played variations of the vampire. The word vamp was now a verb. We manufactured films more or less as one would manufacture sausages. Theda's vamp character began to evolve. Not always evil incarnate, the vamp became the striving woman who seeks sexual and intellectual fulfillment. Yet she is primitive by nature, and when betrayed, takes revenge on mankind. She is a perfect example of a 19th century evolutionary theory called gender dimorphism. Men were destined to become more and more intelligent, more and more focused on the life of the brain. Ironically, the more evolved woman in uh, this kind of theory would be the, the woman who is more passive, more uh, focused on simply existing as a, a housewife, what I have called the household nun. The description of the less evolved woman would be the, uh, the description of uh, Theta Barra, the, the woman who is sexual, who is predatory in her interests. Stories of this predatory female were meant as cautionary tales, but many found them thrilling. Millions, in fact. To this point, Theda Barra has acted for 11 pictures. There are 40 prints of each in circulation. The Fox Company has not had one of the 440 idle a single day. This means that 440 theaters... In February 1916, the New York Times estimated that 182 million people had seen Theda Barra's films. Three and a half million persons make up Ms. Barra's audience, or 182 million persons in the course of a year. As the year continued, Theda became a sort of international vampire queen. A Russian vamp in The Serpent, she became a Mexican vamp in Gold and the Woman, and a modern American vamp in The Eternal Sappho, of which a Cleveland reporter wrote, Miss Barra is a vampire again to be sure, but this time not a deliberate cold-blooded one. She is driven by fate and she wrecks the lives of men who come into contact with her, but she does not mean to do it. You will not hate this Theta Barra, and for the most part you will sympathize with her, nay, perhaps even like her. Theda Barra was the vamp. The LA Times called her the champ vamp. She was uh, definitely the leader in her field, and it was very frustrating for her because she was forced to play this one-dimensional, not even two-dimensional character. Theda's name started to appear in the titles and lyrics of popular songs. Photoplay magazine offered the recipe for the Theda Barra sandwich, a spicy affair described as the sandwich that bites a little and says more. I remember passing a theater where my name was ablaze in electric lights. A friend with me said, aren't you proud? But I wasn't. A rolling eye and an undraped figure were all the public expected of a vampire in the movies. I was an actress. In mid-June, Fox released Theta's five reel version of East Lynn. It is the second of Theta Barra's features known to survive. Here, she is not a vamp at all. The story, both as novel and play, had survived as a popular standard for half a century. By 1916, it is likely that almost everyone knew the plot before they entered the theater. Theda plays the tragic heroine, Lady Isabel, whose entire life unravels when she begins to suspect her husband of infidelity. As an actress, Theda Barra believed that great emotion was effectively communicated by grand gesture. She was not alone. Many actors continued to use 19th century theatrical styles into the 1920s. This is not simply bad acting, but a deliberate technique, a measured means of translating human feeling into visual form. 
A few actors already understood that film was a medium in which such stylization was unnecessary. But in 1916, they were in the minority. Most, like Theta, firmly believed that the power of popular theater required little alteration in its transformation to film. East Lynn is dated not only by its acting. Director Bertram Bracken gave in to the temptation to visualize obvious cliches. When the villain, Captain Levison, tries to convince Theta's Lady Isabel that her husband is having an affair, the film cuts to a shot of a snake in the grass. Even so, Theta garnered fine reviews for her role. While East Lynn continued its run, Under Two Flags opened in July. Under Two Flags took place in the desert, but it was an all-American character, and that's why she liked it. It was a pearl-white, adventurous, all-American gal kind of character, and a heroine as well. She had a great time riding horseback. She got to fling herself around and save the hero, and it was a fun film for her to do. Under Two Flags was very well received critically, and in fact, a lot of newspaper critics said this is the sort of film Theda Barris should be doing. Her superb emotional work makes her cigarette almost a work of art. She displays buoyant enthusiasm and a vivacious personality. She has visualized the immortal daughter of the regiment with consummate art. Besides finding a role she loved, in Under Two Flags, Theta found a collaborator, director J. Gordon Edwards. A fatherly figure, Edwards came from the legitimate stage. He was Barra's seventh film director, and at nearly 50 years of age, by far the oldest. Fox was a little unique among the early studios. It was set up as a, as a director's units. And so once Theda Berra and Gordon Edwards uh, clicked, it, they became the Theda Berra unit. Edwards would direct her next 21 films. Through the years, many writers have cast William Fox as the villain in Theda Berra's life, handing her countless vampire roles while sabotaging any chance to break the mold. Fox presented Theta as vampire during the lucrative springtime. Few theaters had cooling systems, and in the hot summer, when business fell off sharply, most of Theta's non-vamp roles got their run. But the plot is not that simple. Fall was the season for Fox's biggest blockbusters, and October 1916 saw Theta premiering in a role that seems unbelievable today. Fox Film Corporation proudly presented a spectacular production of Shakespeare's immortal play, Romeo and Juliet. With 31-year-old Theda Berra playing innocent, virginal, teenage Juliet. As with Carmen, Fox's Romeo competed with a big-budget production from another studio, with two big names to Fox's one. Francis X. Bushman and Beverly Bain were rival stars, while Theda had the lesser Harry Hilliard as her Romeo. Both Fox and Metro produced Romeo and Juliet in 1916. It was the last time that Fox would uh, compete with another studio for the same title. Critical consensus went with Theda Berra. Miss Berra is a better Juliet than Miss Bain, for she brings to the play's tragic moments all the steam heat that the cool Beverly lacks. Theda had succeeded in four sympathetic roles in a row, and she had played Shakespeare, even though in a silent film, Maybe she really could free herself from the curse of the vampire. What a year this would be for Theda Berra. She would star in four spectacular roles. Victor Hugo's Esmeralda, Dumas's La Dama de Camellia, the infamous Madame du Barry, and the immortal Cleopatra if only it hadn't started out so badly. The story of the Darling of Paris, which was very loosely based on uh, the Hunchback of Notre Dame, of course, they could not have an evil priest in the story, so they changed him into an evil doctor. They couldn't have a hunchback hero, because who wants to look at a hunchback hero? So they had the evil doctor cure Quasimodo's hunchback. The darling of Paris is played by Theda Barra, happily married to Quasimodo at the end of the film. The darling of Paris premiered to large crowds, if modest acclaim. Though completed in the spring, Fox held back Camille until September. In April of 1917, the United States had declared war on Germany, and America's youth signed up to fight. 
no new Theta Barra production would appear during the hot summer. When Camille was finally released, Fox advertised it in superlative terms. Camille was a masterpiece of Barra art, a Theta Barra super picture. She had no time to bask in the glory. Theta had worked all summer. With J. Gordon Edwards, she was putting the finishing touches on the biggest film of her career, the movie that would define Theta Barra to the world. Cleopatra is one of the most sought-after films. Uh, it's on the AFI's 10 most wanted list of lost films. Um, and it's a crime that it's lost. The sets, the costumes, the makeup, the love scenes, everybody loved that. The role of Cleopatra was Theta Barra's most interesting one to herself. The censors were, it went crazy over Theta Barra's costume or lack of same. In more humorous circles, they said that she was getting Barra and Barra. Theta Barra's public loved it. It's hard to know exactly how long Fox prepared to make Cleopatra. As early as the end of 1915, he had the production in mind. Publicity, begun early in 1917, described the wonders of the super production to come. Selig and Goldfrapp informed a credulous world that Fox's number one star had been preordained to play the deadly Egyptian love goddess. It seems an inscription on a tomb in Thebes had been found to predict the coming of the great actress. But the clincher was the discovery that her name was, in fact, an anagram for Arab death. I think the Fox people probably realized that her name was an anagram for Arab death pretty early in her career, but they were saving that little tidbit up for Cleopatra because it was such a perfect bit of publicity for that particular film. Theda spent hours studying the Egyptian collection at New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art. She also cheerfully contributed to Selig and Goldfrapp's hype by recalling past lives for her press interviews. I lived in ancient Egypt, probably at Thebes. I remember crossing the Nile on barges to Karnak and Luxor, as plainly as I recall crossing the Hudson on the ferry. To make Cleopatra, Theta would have to do more than cross the Hudson. All of her films had been made on the East Coast, but Fox had opened a studio in Los Angeles, and Theta would have to leave her beloved New York City whether she liked it or not. When she arrived in Los Angeles in May, Fox installed his number one star in a huge mansion on West Adams Boulevard. A Los Angeles Times reporter gave a first-hand description of the star for the benefit of local readers. Miss Barra talks exceedingly well on her art, esoteric Buddhism, English literature, and the plumbing in California bungalows. There's not one thing you can tell her about Cleopatra, from politics to sandals. She even concocted a perfume with the help of perfumer Alice Hammond. Cleopatra was Fox's biggest production to date. Sets filled the new Fox back lot and beyond. More sets were constructed 50 miles northwest on the beach at Ventura. The Battle of Actium was filmed off the coast of Balboa, 50 miles to the south. Selig and Goldfrapp claimed that 3,000 people worked in the cast and crew. A little later, it seems, they added a zero and called it 30,000. But the breathtaking spectacle of Cleopatra was not limited to sets covered with crowds of extras. The material of Theta's costumes, one wag claimed, cost $1,000 a yard yet she seemed to be wearing only 10 cents worth. No less authority than the New York Times agreed that this was simply a matter of historical accuracy. Miss Barra wears 50 distinctively different costumes, many of which are so thoroughly in attune with the period that they are likely to cause not a little comment. I've gotten over being self-conscious in regard to my costumes, and to think once I cried for two days over having to appear in a one-piece bathing suit and a fool there was. Fox carefully wrapped this juicy tale of sex and skin in the papyrus of historical authenticity. He surrounded Theta with co-stars of unimpeachable integrity, including noted Shakespearean actor Fritz Leiber as Julius Caesar. The script of Cleopatra is quite an extraordinary script and a, a very well-developed screenplay. On set, Theta appeared to enjoy collaboration with director J. Gordon Edwards. I have the scene thought out in a general way, but upon coming into it, I change many things. Mr. Edwards kindly allows me to work out my own ideas. Not everyone, however, found this queen quite so easy to work with. By the time Theta Barra is making Cleopatra Salome, when she's at the apex uh, of her career, she is lording it over other people. At least this is the record. This came as a result of that star status. 
where people are adoring you and you can do no wrong. It could also have come from standing nearly naked on a set surrounded by hundreds of people waiting for the next camera setup. And when she left her star status behind her, this shed very, very quickly. Theta left a very different impression on Fritz Leiber Jr., the seven-year-old son of Theta's movie Caesar. One very hot day, my mother took me on a streetcar to see my father. There were some stuffed leopards that I think were real, and a golden statue of a woman with her breast spared. I thought the statue was real gold, but now I'm sure it wasn't. My father was wearing a toga. He introduced me to a woman with thick black hair and dark eyes with makeup. I was a little bit intimidated because of her headdress, but she was absolutely nice to me and not in any way scary once I'd gotten used to her. She was Theta Bera. There was a Negro man in the scene with her, dressed as a slave, I guess, and she was perfectly nice to him, even though people often weren't so nice to colored people in those days. I don't recall the dialogue, but I remember they stayed in character. A few years later, I saw another movie being made, another silent movie, and the actors were just talking about the ball game while they were pretending to speak their characters' lines. But my father and Theta Bera were actually being Caesar and Cleopatra. My father projected his lines as if he were speaking from the stage, but Miss Bera just spoke her lines normally. There was absolutely nothing wrong with her voice, but there was nothing special about her voice either. I could tell she hadn't taken elocution lessons. When she finished her scene with my father, Theta Bera kissed me. I recall being impressed by her dark brown eyes, which seemed to me very deep and hungering. I wrote a story years later called The Girl with the Hungry Eyes, and maybe that's where I started to get the idea. From Theta Bera. After the film wrapped, she stayed in Los Angeles. On August 16th, the Los Angeles Times claimed, Regarding Cleopatra, Miss Barra is attending to supervising the cutting of the picture, her director, Mr. Edwards, having gone away on a short vacation trip. I feel quite pleased with the picture. In fact, though one always sees flaws in her own work, I believe it compares favorably with anything I've ever done. The Theta Barra superproduction of Cleopatra premiered in New York City on October 14th, 1917. The New York Times loved it. The result is an uncommonly fine picture that was unreeled for the first time at the Lyric Theater last night before an audience, which included the dazzling Miss Barra herself. An avalanche of advertising covered the country. In New York, 77,000 people saw it in an 11-week unprecedented run. Cleopatra and Salome are probably the most popular, sought-after ones today I believe because of the acting, because of the length, and because of the spectacular scenes in both movies. When Cleopatra came out, you had a real blockbuster. According to Fox publicity at the time, Cleopatra cost $500,000. Uh, in fact, it only cost $293,471. It was common to exaggerate production costs in those days. Later, Fox publicity claimed that the 11-week run at the Lyric had actually been six months. Such hype was hardly necessary. Cleopatra played theaters around America for two and a half years. Yet today, the film has been lost. The last time anybody knows of anyone seeing Barra's Cleopatra was in 1934 when Cecil B. DeMille looked at it for, in preparation for his own production of Cleopatra starring Claudette Colbert. The original negative of Cleopatra, along with most of Fox's other silent films, is presumed to have perished in a vault fire in Little Ferry, New Jersey in 1937. While the film itself is lost, film historian Philip Dye has meticulously cataloged hundreds of still photographs that remain, tracing their relationship to the original script. His reconstruction gives a fascinating taste of what the original must have been like. In the Fox film, Pharaon is true heir to the Egyptian throne. Because of his love for Cleopatra, he has warned her of a plot to remove her from power. He now realizes she has used this information against him.
In addition to this work, a single fragment from the original film has been found and preserved. It is seen here for the first time in many years. Unless more can be found, this is all that remains of Theda Berra's greatest triumph. On November 18, 1917, Theda's entire family changed their names to Berra. All the petitioners stated that Berra was an old family name. She loved making Madame du Barry, perhaps especially because of the costumes. Their designer, George James Hopkins, became her protege. Though Theda was bound by contract to Fox, her salary could be renegotiated annually. By 1918, it had reportedly risen to $3,000 per week. On average, she made a new film every seven weeks. Theda wanted a vacation. Instead, Fox gave her more vamp roles. Her first release of 1918, The Forbidden Path, was typical. Innocent girl, seduced by artist, becomes debauched vamp seeking revenge. She was typecast by both her public and by Fox. Fox put her into the vamp movies because they made money, but it's true that people wanted to see her as a vamp. Though popular, Theda's reviews were slipping. What had once seemed bold became, by repetition, predictable. Miss Barra has substituted a low-cut gown for any attempt at clever acting. Another reviewer, noting Theda's Rubenesque physique, suggested that perhaps she should change her name to Fida Barra. But perhaps the unkindest cut came from a paper called the Brooklyn Eagle. Theda Barra's Cleopatra could never tempt a man to be late for dinner, much less give up the throne of Rome. When she was not repulsive, she was funny. Despite her critics, Theda's films, including The Rose of Blood and Madame du Barry and The Forbidden Path, continued to prove solid hits. Internal memos prove that in mid-1918, Fox still considered William Farnham and Theda Barra his biggest stars. Not that Fox wanted it to stay that way. He divided his output into low, medium, and high-budget productions. Fox sought to introduce new faces in cheap films, develop them into modest stars through medium-budget productions, then move them up to the top spot as their popularity spiked. He signed June Caprice to play good girl roles because she won a Pickford look-alike contest. But looking like Mary Pickford wasn't the same as being Mary Pickford. Jewel Carmen was a backup ingenue who proved more trouble than she was worth. Second string vampires included Virginia Pearson, Madeline Traverse, Sonia Markova, and Valeska Surratt, who left the movies shortly after Fox spent a fortune promoting her. Theda Berra remained Fox's main attraction. He even released a cartoon in the animated Button Jeff series called Meeting Theda Berra. Theda was unusually enthusiastic about her next production, The Soul of Buddha. It was loosely based on the true story of Mata Hari, whose arrest and execution had been reported only months earlier. Theda's vampire spy, named Bava Hari, was reformed by true love, but dies while dancing in a Paris cafe at the hands of a homicidal Buddhist priest. Theda's enthusiasm for this strange tale was simple. She wrote it. According to the Fox Studio records, The Soul of Buddha was written by uh, Theda Berra. The story, the original story was. They paid her for it, certainly, and it's on their, their official records as her story. The Soul of Buddha was not well received. The Soul of Buddha is a sodden conglomeration with Miss Berra finally dying an air clawing death. Miss Berra simply vamps all over the place. In spite of this, her personal popularity was at an all time high. She volunteered to sell war bonds at public rallies. This is Liberty Day. Today it is our privilege to loan our government the money to free this world from despotism forever and ever. She started that drive by announcing that she would give $5,000 if 100 men in the audience would each take a $50 bond and nearly caused a riot. She reached that goal. In February 1918, she was informed that the 158th Infantry Regiment had selected her as its godmother by unanimous vote. She accepted it once. But while Theda visited her soldiers, there was trouble on the Fox lot. Movie receipts were falling. The war was blamed, but in addition, late in the year, the public was frightened by the worldwide influenza pandemic. 
people wore masks on the street and avoided indoor crowds. Many movie theaters shut their doors for the season. That year, the flu took 500,000 American lives and killed more worldwide than in all of World War I. According to Fox's numbers, until 1918, film rentals had been rising from one to three million dollars each year. Now they were flat while production costs were up. Due in part to star salaries, net profit was down. For 1918, Fox Film Corporation earnings shrank to half that of the previous year. William Fox was getting nervous. Meanwhile, Theda Barrow was making her next big epic. One thing you have to remember is that because we didn't have reruns, we didn't have video cassettes. Once you had a popular film, the only way to capitalize on that was to make something that was quite similar. And uh, Salome was designed to satisfy that need to see Cleopatra again in an exotic role on a grand scale. Theda was back in Los Angeles again, living comfortably at a second West Adams Boulevard address. Do I love California? You will believe I do when I tell you I arise an hour earlier than I need to in order to spend the time in my wonderful garden. Designer George Hopkins worked closely with Theda to create historical costumes of an extremely brief nature. Elaborate sets were built and hundreds of extras cast. Theda, in lofty terms, spoke of her desire to interpret the work of a great playwright. As Salome, I tried to absorb the poetic impulse of Oscar Wilde. I tried to interpret the extraordinary, the hopeless moral disintegration of a woman's soul. Salome was released on August 10, 1918, and this time her reviews surpassed Cleopatra. And for me, and probably for thousands of others, Salome, the alluring, the cruel, will always be the colorful, intricate characterization of Theta Bera. It is surprising today to think that Theda Bear's theatrical gestures might have added up to an intricate characterization, but this is exactly what Theda hoped she had achieved. One could study her forever, and while doubtless my conception has taken many liberties with the popular idea of Salome, I mean to imply in my interpretation that her love for John the Baptist was an intricate emotion. People talk about Cleopatra being the great lost film of hers, but actually Salome was a much better production. She looked much better in it, and it was reviewed much better. Salome was a hit, but overall balance sheets for the film industry were grim. So in the summer, even before the release of Salome, Fox began to reissue some of his old films, including at least four of Thetas. The Two Orphans, The Clemenceau Case, and of course A Fool There Was returned to first-run houses. Fox gave a new push to Cleopatra, which had never really left circulation. William Fox would flood the market with Theta Bera films in order to give his company an infusion of cash. Releases kept coming, both old and new. Seven weeks after Salome, Fox released When a Woman Sins. Six weeks after that, The She-Devil. Some extra publicity was gained from the fact that The She-Devil was a comedy featuring Theta's own pet bear cub named Theta Bera. The film I'd love to see of hers is The She-Devil. It's the only comedy Fox ever gave her to do, and unfortunately it was released the same week that World War I ended. It just kind of disappeared. It was the end of 1918, and Theda Barra's contract was due to expire in five months. Returning to New York, she met with William Fox in person, determined to ask for a vacation and a pay raise. Sets were already being prepared for her next epic, a Theda Barra superproduction titled The Queen of Sheba. Shortly after the new year, she received a panicked cable. West Coast papers had reported that Theda Barra had died. She responded with her own press release. I expect to return to Los Angeles soon to live and to die the host of deaths which I hope still await me in my career. Theda Barra, January 9th, 1919. Two days later, news of her demise was again reported. January 11th, 1919. Flash. Theda Barra to leave Fox. Theda Barra may not remain with Fox following the conclusion of her contract in May, according to authoritative word just received from New York. Flash. February 13th, Theta Barra and Gordon Edwards split. Miss Barra is to have a new director for the pictures remaining under her Fox contract, said contract expiring shortly. The end of Theta's days with Fox was a vicious cycle. They said, well, you're making not that much money, so we're not going to give you good production values. 
And she was frustrated by 1919. She really stopped caring. This is the first time in her career when she started showing up late, when she started leaving early, when she was just so disgusted by that point that she just stopped giving 100%. Fox exploited her. He used her up. She made Fox. And when he had used her up, he threw her away. And that's why I have a fairly low opinion of the man. I think when Fader met him, he was a tall, good-looking, famous, rich person, so he was a very personable man. And even though when I was in California and he was sort of arrogant and autocratic, he was also totally kind and caring. And I would imagine that's how he was with Fader. I feel he treated me the way he treated her. Charles Braben uh, had been in films, working in films from about 1908. He worked for the Edison Company first after a career in theater and uh, came to Fox in 1919 and was assigned work on Theda Barra pictures. They fell in love and uh, became husband and wife in 1921, about the time she retired from the screen. His father was the first man ever to ship live cattle from Australia to England. The family for, from 1825 up till the 1970s were all butchers, with very few exceptions. Master butchers, if you like, and a well-known Liverpool family. And Uncle Charlie was one of those exceptions. Uncle Charlie, as I understood it, was sent to Chicago to work for Armour and Company because he was bringing the family into a little disgrace with his womanizing. He obviously was a bit of a rogue and a vagabond. By the time he met Theda, Charles Braben was a 37-year-old bachelor and a successful film director. Unlike Gordon Edwards, Braben liked to write his own scripts. Theda and Charles decided on two stories and Fox said okay. The first was Kathleen Mavourney, a story Braben had already adapted and filmed six years earlier as an Edison two-reeler. Theda would play an innocent and beloved Irish beauty. She was ebullient as she described her new persona to the press. This is the best role I've ever had. There isn't the slightest trace of the vampire in Kathleen. How I delight in this quaint little Irish girl. I have adopted her heart and soul. This film was to be the big film of her career in 1919 when she really needed a hit in order to make her marketable to other studios. She wanted it to be a non-vamp film. She wanted it to be a natural film where she got to as she said, laugh and jump and skip and be happy and be a natural, normal human being. Luella Parsons, no friend of Theda's, called it one of the best performances of her career. But despite a positive critical response, Kathleen Mavourneen was bound for trouble. A lot of Irish groups protested at the depiction of Irish peasantry, and some Irish groups protested at the fact of an openly Jewish actress playing a traditional Irish heroine. There were actually riots. There were stink bombs thrown in theaters. There was nothing sour, however, in Theda's relationship with Braben. They liked each other, a lot. From an old Belasco play, they next made La Belle Russe, a story of two dancers, twin sisters, one sweet and true, the other not. The evil Theda tries to switch identities to claim an inheritance from the family of her sister's husband. In the Braben Barra version, however, Theda spends most of her screen time playing the good sister. Since publicity played up the vamp, Theda and Charles had pulled a sort of bait and switch on their audience. Come for the vampire, stay for the good girl. It didn't work. After this, Charles Braben was reassigned by Fox. With the second string director, Theda finished her contract with The Lure of Ambition, released in November 1919. Theda did not attend the premiere. Without renewal, her contract had expired in May. Fox didn't want to lose her in 1920. In fact, they had a number of projects all lined up for her. They had already started building the sets for the Queen of Sheba, which she was to have starred in. As late as July 1919, nearly two months after her contract had expired, Fox claimed that yet one more Theta Barra superproduction was in the works for the coming year. 
She said that she left Fox not because of money or because she was difficult or because she had lost her public, which she said were the usual things that people ascribe to why she left motion pictures, but because she wanted a vacation. Theda Berra had made 39 feature films in 56 months. One of Fox's two biggest stars, by the end, she was making $4,000 a week. What happened? It could have been the vacation. It could have been the money. Fox profits were falling, and Theda wanted $5,000 a week. She wasn't the only one who knew her worth. Bickford, Chaplin, Fairbanks, and Griffith all left their old studios to form United Artists at the same time. Some say that vamps were going out of style, but Pola Negri played Madame du Barry and Carmen and other Theda-like roles with great success. Child actress Baby Peggy got chuckles from vamping as Carmen. A host of copycats kept the vamp going for years. The vamp never died. She became the femme fatale. If Fox was trying to contain costs, it didn't help. Unable to build a star of the same magnitude in-house, Fox replaced Theda Berra with famous serial queen Pearl White. He put the expensive Queen of Sheba in turnaround for a year and a half. But the same year that Theda's contract expired, Fox's profits evaporated. For the first time, Fox Film Corporation finished a year in the red. Have you ever met a woman who hunched her shoulder and looked sideways at a man to attract him? I haven't, although I may have done it on the screen. Why did I do it? Because people prefer an exaggerated fiction to a subtle fact, and because it is much easier to project the obvious than the profound. Theda left her home in Los Angeles. It was rented by Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle, which was duly noted by a cartoon in the Los Angeles Times. She vacationed in Europe and considered possibilities for the future. Even though there were lots of projects that were in development for her, she walked away from Fox, and she was quickly signed up by a Broadway producer who wanted to put her back on Broadway in a play called The Blue Flame. The big question about The Blue Flame is, did Theda know what a horrible play it was, and why did she take it? A.H. Woods, who was the producer, was known for doing camp even before the word camp was known. The Blue Flame is the story of a Frankenstein-like scientist who tries to recreate life after his beautiful fiancée is struck by lightning. But while the woman is reborn, the soul is not, and the revivified Theda becomes a vampire who preys on any man she can find. Theda's contract promised her $1,500 a week plus half the net profits. In out-of-town tryouts, the production sold out, her weekly check totaled $10,700. Theda had very happy memories of this particular production. She said, when we were out of town, we had such celebrity that we filled the theater every night. It was standing room only. People loved the play, they loved her. And then they came to New York. And she said, those naughty critics, they were waiting for me. My favorite review of The Blue Flame said that at the end of the third act, she made a speech in which she said that God had been very kind to her. Probably she referred to the fact that at no time during the course of the evening did the earth open up and swallow up the authors, the star, and all the company. After two months on Broadway, A.H. Woods took the show on the road where it continued to fill houses. For Theda, The Blue Flame managed to be both a financial success and a professional disaster. Instead of a crackling good time, the play seemed more like unintentional self-parody. Theda and her sister Lori returned to Europe. On the boat, Lori met a newspaper man, fell in love, and married him in Paris. When Theda returned to New York, Charles Brapin was waiting on the dock. Theda Berra, aged 35, and Charles Brapin, 39, were married by a Justice of the Peace in Greenwich, Connecticut, on July 2, 1921. It was the first marriage for each. I think it was a marriage of adult love. I don't know how passionate a marriage it was, but they were great friends. What appealed to her, she said first, was the way he walked. He strode across a room, and she said even into the 1950s, she could still just stand there and watch him walk across a room. While Braben continued to work for Fox, directing such films as The Broadway Peacock with Pearl White, Theda toured in vaudeville. From the stage, Theda asked her audience what sort of role she should play when she returned to the movie screen. The answer came back loud and clear, Vamp. 
Theda returned to play housewife to Charles, but she did not consider herself retired. Meanwhile, newspapers were full of Theda sightings. She was going to sign with First National. No, she wasn't. Producer B.P. Feynman had her under contract, Todd Browning, to direct. It didn't happen. She was working on a picture with producer C.C. Burr. It never appeared. Then, Theda received an offer from Selznick Pictures. My father used to boast that in 1922, there were five, count them, five pictures playing in Times Square, which were Selznick movies. On November 3, 1922, at a lavish party held for 2,000 guests at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in New York City, 20-year-old David O. Selznick announced that Theda Barrow would star in a Selznick picture for $5,000 a week, and it was destined to be a mammoth spectacle. My father was a very optimistic individual, and according to all reports, was very exuberant and very excited about signing Theda Barra. He was looking for a role for Theda Barra that was not just the vamp, something where she had some intelligence, some sympathy, and not just the lady who seduces every man in sight. They made big announcements, taking ads in motion picture world, saying, Theda Barra in a Selznick picture, the easiest way from the great stage success. And then, all of a sudden, David's father, Louis Selznick, had a stroke, which turned his entire operation into chaos. They had these two pictures waiting release. They went to the bank to get more money. The collateral wasn't there. Suddenly, there isn't going to be the easiest way. There isn't going to be any way. And very sadly for my father, he didn't get to produce his first movie until he was, I think, 24. In April 1923, Theda and her husband returned to California. Theda Berra returns to Los Angeles. The fireworks started soon after the initial clinch following the end of Theda's journey from New York. Are you going into pictures again, Mrs. Braven, was the bombshell. I certainly am, was Theda's decisive answer. She is not, was the stout rejoinder of her better one-fifth. Why, what do you mean, was Theda's comeback, as she turned upon her husband, disarming him by the use of every weapon in her armory, tarried glances, shrugged shoulders, curling lips. A few days later, Theda explained. My husband, in the bottom of his heart, desires me to retire from the screen or to appear only in pictures directed by him. I want to retire from the screen when I get ready, but I want to go out in a blaze of glory. At the moment, all the glory was going to Charles. He was hired by the Goldwyn Company to direct their epic production of Ben-Hur to be filmed in Italy with a cast of thousands. In September, he sailed to Europe to begin production. Braven would be gone for almost a year. Left alone, Theda immediately incorporated Theda Barra Productions in the tax-friendly state of Delaware with a capitalization reported at $500,000. Again, nothing came of it. Would she never make a comeback? Charles Braben returned from Europe a chastened director. Ben-Hur had bogged down with over $150,000 spent even before shooting started. The Goldwyn Company had been absorbed into MGM, and the new company wanted a new production team. Braben was fired, the film recast, and all of Charles' footage was scrapped. Theda decided she needed to make a film, even if her husband was in the country. In December 1924, Chadwick Productions, a small, if respectable, poverty row outfit, announced that Theda Barra would star in The Unchastened Woman. This was the real thing. Unchastened Woman, her comeback film, which is uh, theoretically um, a sympathetic role, though she plays around with it in different ways. This is a kind of vamp is Madonna, or Madonna is vamp role. We first see her husband in a very palatial uh, establishment with his secretary sort of canoodling, and she's upstairs with the doctor, having just found out she's pregnant. And she's all wrapped and excited and can't wait to tell her husband. And then she walks down there's this grand staircase, so she has a wonderful entrance and oversees this scene going on down below. And horrified, she sneaks back upstairs and decides not to tell him. 
There's a wonderful revenge moment that I think must have just absolutely endeared her to every female in the audience. She brings the secretary in and pretends to be friendly with her and says, I want to give you something, and gives her a dress of hers. It's a beautiful dress. The secretary is thrilled. She's just so, so surprised. So she decides she's going to wear it on her next date with the husband. The husband, they're sitting in some garden, there she is in the dress, and he looks, recognizes the dress. It's the dress that Theta Barra had worn the night they became engaged. I mean, it's like boiling the bunny. It's a, gra <laughs> it's, it's a great moment, and he's horrified, and it really is the beginning of the end of his relationship with the secretary, because somehow it brings home to him what he's done. So she goes off to Europe. She has this uh, sort of wonderful, sort of slightly dual personality in Venice where she's living the high life with all these men courtiers and at the same time being the perfect mother. She becomes a sort of patroness of this one architect. When they come home, he sort of comes after her. Meanwhile, her husband is broken up with the secretary, but he, and he wants her back, but she won't come back. But he thinks she's having an affair with the architect. husband comes in, find this child that's his, and is reunited with her. So she really does cover a considerable range. The film had been based on a play that was a fairly standard vamp tale. Theta's version changed the plot to make her character completely sympathetic. Whether or not the public considered this another bait-and-switch ploy, the unchastened woman did not revive her career. Just before the release of her Chadwick feature, the LA Times reported that Theda Berra, longtime champ vamp of the world, had signed a contract with Hal Roach to star in a comedy. Vamping requires no artistry whatever. Comedy requires a real test of skill. There are such delicate nuances, such opportunities for subtlety. For me, henceforth, High comedy. If high comedy was what Theta was looking for, the Hal Roach studio was most likely not the place to find it. Her two-picture deal started with Madame Mystery. The comedy revolved around Theta playing a mysterious spy who is carrying a secret helium nitrate bomb. Two thieves try to steal her secret. When one of the thieves accidentally swallows the bomb, the helium expands inside him with perverse, if not grisly, results. Theta chose not to make another film with Roach. A single shot of her left over from Madame Mystery was inserted into a second film, 45 minutes from Hollywood, possibly to fulfill the contractual obligation that she appear in two Roach comedies. Thus ended the career of Theda Berra, not in a blaze of glory, but as a dying ember. Forty-one years old at the time of her last film, though only admitting to 36, Theda remained trim and stylish and beautiful throughout the next decade. The Bravens bought a simple home on Alpine Drive in Beverly Hills and settled into a comfortable married life. There were occasional appearances at studio parties, local theater, and on the radio, but never in film. There were always announcements of an impending comeback, of an autobiography that was almost finished, of movies based on her life, 
they never materialized. The 1930s found her on radio. Here's something you haven't heard before. Something everyone listening in will hear for the first time on any radio program. Folks, I want you to meet Peter Barrett. <laughs> Peter, I've been looking forward to meeting the number one vampire of all time. Thank you, Ken. According to the records, you vamped your way through 44 pictures and left a trail of broken men in each one of them. I guess that about makes you the wickedest woman of your time, does it? Well, I was no Shirley Temple. <laughs> Yes, it's hard to realize I made 44 pictures and yet never spoke a word on the screen. Gosh, they certainly didn't give you very good parts, did they? <laughs> Beyond films, her name had a life of its own. Producers were always discovering the new Theda Barra. In 1936, it was Marla Shelton. In 1939, Lana Turner. In 1950, Roberto Rossellini announced he had found the Italian Theda Barra. Ellie Parvo in his film, Woman. But the original vamp was now a housewife. Not that I ever secretly crocheted antimacassars or anything like that. Marriage is the hardest career of all. But it's the most worthwhile because the rewards are sweetest. Now I think I have the hang of it, but I still can't tell you how it's done. According to my mother, she was a sweet, agreeable, domestic, lovely woman, and they were very close friends. They hung out together. Mother was working, and Theta gave her tips about what to wear to audition. She, she befriended her. Mother was younger than she was and starting out. And Theta was a very warm, inclusive woman. She, mother said she had a very warm heart and was very generous and very funny. She said she had her laughing. She had a little risque humor, but that was fine. Colleen Moore talked a great deal about Charles Braben and Theda Barra. She first met Theda Barra through her husband, who was a director on two of Colleen's biggest films. She was invited many times over to the Braben's home, and she said these were, for Hollywood, very sophisticated parties. They were very literate. There'd be a mixture of authors. There'd be a mixture of visiting British dignitaries. If it got really bad, Theda would come out and she would start to do parodies of herself as the vamp. And Colleen said, nobody was funnier than Theda playing an imitation of Theda Barra. At one such party, Theda played host to the woman who had started it all. In the 1930s, the great uh, British actress, Mrs. Patrick Campbell, had come to the United States. Theda Barra had a wonderful post-play reception for her. In 1934, the Little Theatre of the Beverly Hills for Professionals presented Bella Donna, a role Mrs. Patrick Campbell had created in 1911. This time, the production starred Theda Berra. Her career had come full circle. The Los Angeles Times said, Miss Berra was alluring throughout. There was a slight inclination toward older stage techniques, but her voice was throatily pleasing. At the close of the last performance she would ever give before a paying audience, Theda Berra as Belladonna turned from the stage and walked out through the sand dunes of Egypt. She was never without offers, but ultimately she would find fault with any plan, as Representative Alan Brock discovered when he tried to bring her back to the stage in Summerstock in 1947. Theda and Alan worked to try to showcase Theda Berra in a way that would allow her to seem appropriate to the modern day audience. Unfortunately, they couldn't come up with the project. The thing that Alan became aware of very quickly was the fact that she was far too rich and far too comfortable to do anything that wasn't going to be 100% satisfying to her. Edward Firstman, a family friend, told Ron Giannini, Theda was a very private person, dignified, every bit of lady. While Charles, well, he was a gung-ho guy living up life to the utmost of his capacity. She was the practical one in the family because he was a pixie. The fact that they did stay together until she died indicates they must have had some tolerance and affection for each other in, in times when divorce was even then quite common. 
Their relationship to the end was tinged with the sweet playfulness of young lovers. Historian DeWitt Bodine, visiting her house in the 1950s, observed a birthday card from Theda to Charles, propped on the dresser. The inscription inside read, To my darling Moochie Moo, from your Wiffle Tree. Los Angeles, April 7th, 1955. Theda Barra, the silent screen's vamp, died tonight in California Lutheran Hospital. She was 65 years old. Critically ill with abdominal cancer, Miss Barra entered the hospital February 13th. She was really 69. Theda had managed to put that one over on everyone. Her eyes are always the same, but only her eyes. The movies are lost, but the tremendous variety of her image remains visible on thousands of silver paper prints. Here, Theda's commitment to her art is undeniable. As an artist, she was never afraid to appear unglamorous. She reveled in bold characters from every walk of life every period of history, and many corners of the globe. She was the first star who really made a career out of being bad. She knew what she was doing, she had talent, she had uh, stick to and she was smart enough to play the game. She knew the difference between Theodosia Goodman and Theda Barra, and she never got the two confused. To look into the eyes of Theda Berra today is no longer to be lost, seduced into a world of sin and destruction. She wove her magic and cast her spell on a simpler era. But in a room darkened by veiled lights on a flickering screen, we can still find our way back to the danger and the pleasure of her company when America was young and foolish and the price of admission was 10 cents. Always I have been a charlatan a register of human emotions.